Hi, Tom. Well, I'm really glad to have you in in Paris for this uh, for this talk. And uh, uh, I, I would like to 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 start this uh, discussion with you by um, a question on the on the way you would uh, consider or characterize uh, your own way of doing philosophy, because you've been doing history of philosophy, your books on Descartes and Hobbes are quite well known, but you've also been doing applied ethics uh, and uh, you have a, I think, you tell me if I'm right to say so, a quite uh, a specific uh, position in Warwick. So how would you describe the way you do philosophy, you've been doing philosophy over the past Well, first, thank you for having me. And um, uh, I've been doing philosophy for now just over 40 years. So um, I've started in epistemology, um, and I moved briefly into philosophy of science. Uh, and I've worked in the history of philosophy, and I've worked in applied ethics. I've worked on some moral theory. So I think of myself as being quite a generalist in philosophy. I don't specialize. I don't work in a tiny literature mm -hmm. like most of my colleagues. Um, I'm able to read and write across the subject. I don't work in logic. I don't work in, 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 in formal philosophy, but I can read it. I can read it. Um, so I don't know whether I have a characterization of the kind of work I do. Um, most of the work that I've done is um, uh, in history of philosophy and ethics. Um, uh, I guess I would say that the, uh, uh, the work that I've done has been, uh, you know, uh, pushed along by particular uh, uh, commitments and obligations that I have, I've had as I've uh, moved through my career. Um, uh, I've always been interested in how analytic philosophy mm -hmm. relates to other kinds of philosophy, especially history of philosophy. Um, that's been a kind of connecting theme. Um, and uh, could you be a bit more specific on the, the kind of position you have now in Warwick yep. and how you practice philosophy? Because not, not necessarily only in your studio, you know, writing and reading books. You do that, of course. I mean, it's central. But it's not the only aspect of your uh, activity as a philosopher. That's true, that's true. So at uh, Warwick, um, I have um, a job uh, leading a, a little center that's connected with ethics uh, and other subjects. It's called the Interdisciplinary Ethics Research Group. And what we do in that group um, is uh, look for funding uh, for work in ethics, usually alongside uh, people from other subjects, primarily uh, science and technology subjects. We have uh, uh, quite a long history of working with technologists mm -hmm. either in relation to security mm -hmm. or um, in relation to uh, more recently uh, to things like uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, automated vehicles um, uh, and other bits of science that have ethical uh, issues connected to them. That's the, the way that we earn our money. And so a lot of my time is spent uh, applying for money, trying to get grants for money from the UK research councils, and also um, money from uh, Europe, the European Union, for uh, research projects funded by Horizon Europe. And I've been doing that more or less continuously since 2008. Mm -hmm. So for about 15 years now. Yeah. Um, and, and the connected to this uh, position is also your, your interest in, uh, in normative philosophy because yes. you've got a strong interest uh, in uh, epistemics um, uh, but you also are interested in, in normative philosophy. So what, uh, why did you and what was uh, the starting point of this interest? Uh, you have in normative philosophy and how do you characterize it also, which is uh, an expression we now are familiar with, even in the uh, francophone world, but which is not so easy to characterize. Uh, 
Uh, no, you mean uh, uh, characterizing applied ethics and so on. Yes. And, and normative philosophy. Yes, yes, normative philosophy in general. Um, uh, well, um, I got into uh, normative philosophy perhaps a little bit by accident um, because uh, my first job after leaving Oxford, I did my doctorate in Oxford, uh, my first job after leaving Oxford was at the Open University in the UK which does a lot of its teaching via television and via um, correspondence texts and so on. Um, and uh, one of the first uh, things that I did when I was there was help to design a course in applied ethics mm -hmm. that was considered the kind of course that would reach a lot of students mm -hmm. and um, uh, I was also very interested in um, some of the uh, issues in applied ethics that had arisen at that time so we're talking about the mid 80s or so mm -hmm. and the kind of things that had influenced me up to then were um, collections of essays for example Tom Nagel's a book called Mortal Questions, which is not only to do with applied ethics questions, but is uh, includes uh, applied ethics questions. That had been a substantial influence. Um, another influence was uh, the the very good uh, uh, volume on utilitarianism mm -hmm. that was put together by Bernard Williams and J.J.C. Smart. Uh, Williams's uh, defense of uh, Williams's critique of utilitarianism was very influential. So that was the kind of background for my getting involved in applied ethics. Mm -hmm. The first work I did was to do with capital punishment. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in uh, retributive theories. I thought that they had had a lot less attention than they should have done. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I became interested in um, Kant's uh, mm -hmm. defense of, of uh, um, capital punishment and also Mill's defense of capital mm -hmm. punishment and I even worked on combining these two approaches um, a little bit. So, I mean, that was, that was the early history of my mm -hmm. uh, being involved. Um, I think you also wanted to know, you know, what is the, uh, what's the point, so to speak, of nor normative philosophy? Well, or what's on the point of uh, this kind of practice, which is, especially in, in, in France, not always easy to, to right. say. I mean, they have been, of right. course, uh, works on it, but maybe the, uh, the uh, person listening to our uh, uh, interview would like to know a bit more about... Uh, yes. Yes. Well, I think in the English-speaking world, um, the interest in normative philosophy um, started to become very strong after Rawls uh, mm -hmm. published uh, A Theory of Justice. That was in 1973, the very year that I started graduate work. Um, before then, people had been interested in meta-ethics primarily, uh, in the analysis of moral concepts like right or obligation or things of that kind. Um, uh, Rawls was the first uh, philosopher to take up systematically normative questions, mm -hmm. in particular the kinds of policies that governments should adopt in the name of justice. Uh, so I think that's the crucial point in recent Anglo-American mm -hmm. philosophy is uh, Rawls. Uh, but since uh, then, since Rawls, there have been lots of other uh, people who've, who've got into the field. Uh, Dworkin is one, Nozick is mm -hmm. another, Parfit is another, mm -hmm. uh, Tim Scanlon is mm -hmm. another. Um, and many others. Uh, it's a very, very flourishing field. In my opinion, the most flourishing field mm -hmm. in Anglo-American philosophy at the moment. Thank you. So uh, this, uh, uh, we maybe come back to this uh, aspect of your, of your, of your work later on, if we have time. But I, I would like to 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 know a bit more about your uh, uh, early interest. Uh, in uh, history of philosophy here. and uh, more specifically I would like to to understand uh, how you managed and I think uh, uh, successfully so to combine a uh, very uh, detailed precise analysis of the text with uh, 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 a reflection on uh, what to do with uh, what Descartes and Hobbes in particular have done. So could you say a bit more about your, yes. your method? I would call that your method. All right. Well, um, uh, just a sort of autobiographical note to begin with. Um, when I was an undergraduate at McGill, uh, that's where I did my, my first degree, um, 
much of what I'd, I was taught there was history of philosophy, but I was interested also in the uh, analytic philosophy that was taught there. So I was always interested in how these two things went together because mm -hmm. they didn't seem to me to go very well together uh, when I was taught them at McGill. And one of the things that I've tried to do in my own work is to put them together. So that's one of the impetuses for you know my working as I do on the history of philosophy. But another uh, uh, influence on that has been the state of publishing in, in the English-speaking world. So uh, there was an important series of books called Arguments of the Philosophers, where the idea was that historical figures could be presented mm -hmm. to a, a reader through their arguments. It was a very analytic uh, philosopher's idea of the history of philosophy, and I wrote uh, in that series. So that series appealed to me because I was interested in the, in the uh, way that uh, history of philosophy and analytic philosophy go together. And that's part of the explanation of the style mm -hmm. that I use, of trying to be very clear, but also working on the text and trying to present philosophers through the medium of their arguments. The other thing that I think is interesting about the way um, I approach uh, history of philosophy is that I'm interested in whether what these philosophers say is true. Mm, Not just mm. what they say, but whether what they say is true. In that respect, they are uh, being treated like other philosophers who are not uh, historical figures. And uh, on this point, uh, uh, could you just uh, give us uh, an example or take Thomas Hobbes, on which you've been writing a lot. You've been yeah. writing a lot on Descartes. We're not going to talk about Descartes today, right. but you've been writing a lot on Hobbes, and this is how we met, to be honest. And yes, yes. As we, we published together this, we edited this volume. Right, right, we did. And after 350 years. We did. Uh, quite a while ago. Yes. But uh, the, the question would be just to uh, understand how, uh, uh, on the, in, in Hobbes, you could just apply your method. What, what's left of Hobbes today? Because and they, there are many theses uh, uh, defended by Hobbes uh, that are just appalling to many people. Yes. And you're saying to us, well, this guy, this philosopher, has something to tell us today, right. And right. which is not just uh, uh, the, the philosophy of Vladimir Putin. No, that's very true. <laughs> so we're not. We certainly don't, I certainly don't deal with Hobbes as if he were some special figure in the history of materialism as Lenin and Marx thought about materialism. Certainly not. I don't deal with Hobbes in that way, though they did. I mean, uh, uh, Hobbes has a place in the Russian tradition. We leave that aside. But, for example, if I think about the, the parts of Hobbes' philosophy that I think are, are permanently valuable, um, uh, you know, I think of his political philosophy, I think of um, uh, uh, his many insights about the fragility of the state, his many insights about the, uh, the kinds of forces within the state which destabilize it, and on the, uh, the various tensions that keep uh, the state from being permanently stable. Um, so I think that's, that's an extremely valuable part. But speaking for myself, I have no, um, I'm not attracted in the least to Hobbes's metaphysics. I'm not attracted to, in the least to the idea that reality is just motion and matter mm -hmm. and it's pretty simple um, and that there are no such things as minds or bodies. I find that uh, uh, ridiculously oversimple. So um, though, though that's not a completely fair uh, presentation of Hobbes's uh, metaphysics, it's pretty simple. <laughs> It's a pretty simple metaphysics in lots of ways, too simple in my view. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I prefer Descartes to, uh, to Hobbes in metaphysics. But, um, you know, there, there's huge uh, uh, complexity and subtlety in his, uh, in his political philosophy. And uh, you've been uh, using, just one more point on this, mm. Uh, mm. you've been uh, opposing the, um, how did you, the un reconstructed Hobbesianism to sober Hobbesianism. Could you say very, uh, uh, in, in, in simple words, what this sober Hobbesianism is and how it connects uh, with uh, liberalism? Uh, 
Okay, so um, what I've tried to do is um, to uh, distinguish the historical Hobbes, which I call unreconstructed Hobbesianism. That's the original historical uh, version of Hobbesianism. Um, I want to distinguish that from a theory that you can uh, arrive at if you revise Hobbes in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And the way in which I've wanted to revise Hobbes in some of the, the work that I've done is by removing some of the exaggerations in Holmes. Mm -hmm. And here are two exaggerations that one finds in Holmes. Mm -hmm. One exaggeration is that in, in most ordinary social behavior, mm -hmm. especially behavior where people are, are slightly nasty to one another, mm -hmm. uh, that these are... Social situations. <laughs> yes, that these are signs of a will to, uh, to fight and maybe fight to the death. Uh, uh, th these are signs of a subtle warlike uh, uh, human nature behind uh, uh, ordinary social uh, conventions. That's one form of exaggeration. Another form of exaggeration is that whenever sovereignty, whenever government is divided or distributed across agents, um, for example in a democratic council composed of many different people, um, the the ability of that entity to govern is very much less than, than in a unitary uh, a sovereign will, such as a, a single monarch, um, and that, in fact, the, the, dis the distribution uh, of power across mm. many agents reproduces a sort of form yeah. of war because mm. people disagree with it mm. amongst themselves mm. in, a, in, a, in a government. Those are exaggerations, mm. it seems to me. Um, you know, if we have customs of civility that are developed over centuries, uh, it isn't plausible to say that instantly we would uh, start stealing from the, the supermarket. Uh, as soon as the first nuclear missile is launched, we probably still put coins into the parking meters. <laughs> that's what probably so, yes. <laughs> That's probably what would happen in the UK anyway. So <clears throat> I'm trying to say those are exaggerations. And sober Hobbesianism is, is the attempt to come up with a version of Hobbes that removes those exaggerations. But in particular, um, uh, there's another way of approaching sober Hobbesianism, and that's via a gap in unreconstructed Hobbesianism, via a gap in the original theory that Hobbes gave. And that gap can be identified by asking the question, how do people in the state of nature, how do people before they are governed decide whom they're going to transfer their right of nature to and appoint as sovereign? Who are they going to uh, entrust their survival to uh, in the state of nature? This is a question that as far as I know Hobbes doesn't answer. It. He doesn't say, how do you recognize the person that you should give the right of nature to? Now, um, uh, one of the things that, that one knows from, uh, from Hobbes is that whoever is the sovereign he ought to be somebody who can see beyond his own interests to the interests of a people. And he ought to be the kind of person who can detach himself from his own interests to identify with the interests of a people. So he's saying that whoever gets the, uh, the right of nature transferred to him, whoever gets a government entrusted in him, is capable of a kind of detachment. And the question is, um, since Hobbes is addressing his writings to all the people who are mm -hmm. actually sovereigns, mm -hmm. who are a great variety, you know, there's, there's the sense in which they might be a cross-section of humanity, and perhaps it's going to be the case that quite a few human beings are capable of detachment. If they're capable of detachment, if they're able to think beyond the pushes and pulls of their own appetites and aversions, perhaps they have within them the makings for government themselves. In other words, if there were a government of detached people, people who could see beyond their own interests to the interests of others and give weight to the interests of others, that might be a basis for a kind of democracy of the detached. Now, I a, like this expression. I mean, I a, a, de saying. a democracy of people who have the capacity for detachment. But, do you think it's possible to have a democracy of the detached if the democracy is not taken as a, a representative democracy with a few 
elite people capable of being detached and the rest just being pulled and pushed by their own passions. What do you understand by this expression, democracy of the detached? Well, Who is I, detached? I think that, that this kind of democracy would take the form of representative democracy, mm -hmm. uh, probably. Um, so uh, uh, people, maybe many people, a group of people, could, um, uh, uh, could identify with uh, the people that they're representing. Uh, maybe they, this group of people, could be authorized by the, uh, um, uh, by the people to become government, uh, to become the government. That's a possibility that's allowed in Hobbes. But the question is, <coughs> um, could every human being or could many human beings be possible members of this council? Mm -hmm. If the answer is, why not? Mm -hmm. uh, if the only entrance condition is detachment, mm -hmm. then uh, uh, one gets away from the idea that, m that government has to be very unitary, which is really yeah. a really important view in Hobbes. And there one starts to go, one starts to get toward a version of uh, distributed, detached governors um, and that seems to me to be uh, the, to give the possibility of a liberal democracy, a semi-liberal democracy in prototype. Mm -hmm. um, so detachment, this, uh, this, uh, the, the fact that many people can be detached is one way in which one gets from the original Hobbes to something more liberal. Um, but another way that one gets uh, to that um, uh, uh, picture is via uh, Hobbes's own theory of the duties of the sovereign, because uh, even in Hobbes's original position, it's a duty of the sovereign not just to to, to create the peace, but to uh, create a life in which people can, uh, uh, by their own industry, um, uh, create a, 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 a version of the good life, and people need a kind of liberty uh, to do that. So even within Hobbes's own writings, mm -hmm. one has a picture of a very limited liberty, mm -hmm. but some kind of liberty. Mm -hmm. Those are the elements that take us from, um, uh, from unreconstructed Hobbesianism to sober Hobbesianism, Hobbes without the exaggerations. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, uh, one more question because I think sure. uh, time is running. Okay. But this question connects with what you've just said. And the, this is about your uh, many works on applied ethics. I've got the feeling, and I, I'd like to have your opinion on that, that uh, many, many questions you've been working on, security questions, uh, CCTVs in London, what are they good for or not good for, or the question we're going to discuss in a, in a, in a few minutes uh, in the uh, SPPN seminar, uh, whether uh, deep fakes, for example, uh, make a big deal of difference to uh, political misinformation or not, which is your position. So my question is, concerning those various topics you've, be, you've been working on, whether or not they might be uh, considered as, uh, for some of them, obstacles on the way to this uh, detached democracy yeah. you've been describing. I'm, I'm just uh, pres uh, giving, uh, uh, um, being more specific uh, uh, on this. What I mean is, uh, I think that the questions you address are all questions of related to public policies, mm -hmm. Uh, the art of government, mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, some of those techniques, practices, etc., uh, can be considered as uh, drawbacks, obstacles on the way to uh, a democracy or the detached. Would yes. you say that, or am I, you know, off the hook? Well, I think some of the work that I'm doing. Um, uh, can be uh, characterized that way. Um, uh, if we go into the, this book called Emergencies in Politics where I talk about sober Hobbesianism, one of the things that I'm interested there is the way that fundamentalism mm -hmm. is an obstacle to a democracy of the, the, the detached mm -hmm. because fundamentalism is the view that I'd rather die than mm -hmm. give up certain things. I'd rather fight to the death for certain things mm -hmm. rather than give them up, even if it's illegal 
uh, uh, to uh, you know to fight uh, for for, the, for these things. And I'm saying one of the things I'm saying is that a Hobbesian approach uh, to fundamentalism is a good approach. In other words, Hobbes has no patience whatsoever uh, mm -hmm. for for fundamentalism. He thinks there is nothing mm -hmm. that you can. Uh, there's nothing that you should want to die for mm -hmm. if the elements of peace are secured. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, an, an extremely defensible, mm -hmm. uh, defensible position. And uh, there are some things uh, that create a fundamentalism uh, that uh, would, in a, uh, even in a sober Hobbesian theory, have to be curtailed. And one of those is unlimited freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> that being said, <laughs> hate speech, for example. Hate speech. Yeah. 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 So yeah. this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 a good conclusion. Not to <laughs> expand on our liberty of, of speech. And uh, thank you very much, Tom. I mean, that was really a pleasure to to discuss with you on those topics. We could have gone on and on forever. We can. But we, and we could. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. you.